Having had a look at what the scripture says, it is important to look next at what religious people do with this information. Now that we can see that scripture tells us two different creation accounts, which may or may not be literally true, we can try and decide whether or not the account can be compatible with scientific evidence. There are a range of modern religious responses to the difficulty of the apparent disparity between the Genesis accounts and the scientific ones. Some of them try and demonstrate that scientific and religious accounts can be compatible, others show their incompatibility. The most high-profile high religious response to the debate here is that of creationism. Creationism comes in various different forms, but they all derive from a fairly literal interpretation of Genesis. If scripture is God's word, as many believe, then we should be able to trust it to be true. If it is true, then we should be able to rely on it to tell us exactly how and when the universe and humanity came into being. This is actually a very recent approach, which has grown in popularity, particularly in the USA, not so much as a response to Darwinism, but no more as a responsible response to political issues in the 1920s. The creationist response can be divided into two main areas, young earth and old earth creationism. However, this is a rather simplistic divide. Essentially, young earth creationists would reject all scientific theories regarding the origins of the universe and human life. The Big Bang theory, evolutionary theory, these appear to fly directly in the face of a literal reading of the Bible. The Big Bang theory suggests that the universe began as a result of random chance rather than deliberate design. Evolution suggests mindless programming rather than a loving creator who designed each being. The idea that humanity has come about via the development from other species over millions of years is in direct opposition to the idea of humanity being made in the image of God, separate from other species and fixed or complete from the moment of creation. The young earth creationist response says that the age of the earth is about 6,000 years old. We know this because Bishop James Usher in the 17th century worked out the age of the earth by following the genealogies in the Bible back. He came up with the date October the 23rd, 4004 BC for the beginning of the universe. These fundamentalist young earthers would argue that a literal Adam and Eve were created on day six, along with all the other animals. These animals include dinosaurs, who existed alongside humans until they were destroyed during the flood. The Bible is inerrant, it cannot be wrong, and this leads us to the only possible conclusion, which is that science in the form of geology, cosmology and biology are all wrong. This approach is a kind of fundamentalism which is clearly in conflict with the scientific approach. Having said this, young earth creationists are often involved in their own brand of scientific investigation. Most scientists would call this pseudoscience or ersatz science because it's rather distorted version. As you can see with the dinosaur issue, they embrace an interpretation of science that's consistent with the view that the Bible is literally true. There are a wide variety of attempts by young earthers to scientifically demonstrate the inaccuracy of the Big Bang and evolutionary theory. Another type of approach is what is known as old earth creationism. This accepts the geological age of the earth and attempts to integrate some scientific knowledge with the biblical accounts. Day age creationism argues that the six days of creation were really six geological epochs, much like the Hebrew word yom meant age rather than 24 hour period. We can say that God created in six ages. Alternatively, gap creationism argues that God created the heavens and the earth, but then there followed a gap of 4.5 billion years before the literal creation of Genesis about 6,000 years ago. This model abandons evolution completely, but still upholds geological records. Progressive creationism is another version of old earth creationism. They accept the geological age of the earth, the true age of dinosaurs and so on, but believe that the creation of humans and other modern animals was a special event, literally as Genesis describes. There is no biological link then between humans and other early hominids. 
As you can see, the old Earth accounts make varying attempts to integrate the scientific approach and the religious one, but with varying levels of success. Another form of young Earth creationism is Omphalism. This is named after a book called Omphalos in 1857. This explains that the fossil record was God's way of making the Earth appear to be old when in fact it is not. Adam and Eve were the first humans on Earth, created by God, and so they were not born. As a result, they should have not needed to have navels, since a navel is a scar resulting from the development of life in the womb. However, for a human to not have a navel is unthinkable. Humans have navels, that's part of the human characteristic, so God must have created Adam and Eve with navels, which are evidence of being created through normal evolutionary biology, when in fact they were not. In the same way, the Earth has the same kind of evidence via the fossil record, apparent evidence of the world being old, when in fact it is not. God only wanted to make us think that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. A true scientist doing real research will arrive at the correct scientific conclusions about the world according to science, but will accept this is only what God wants him to see. This is clearly at odds with science and is in direct conflict. If there is any element of compatibility, then it is over the acceptance that the scientific re research can be done, but it includes a complete rejection of the results. Theistic evolution is another form of old earth creationism. Those who follow this approach may reasonably object to being called creationist in the sense that they do not identify with the kinds of approaches we've seen so far. This is the approach that is most acceptable to more, more mainstream Christians. It is the Roman Catholic Church's position and it is also the position of many scientists. This accepts modern science and suggests that they are the tools of God. He chose to create the natural world in this way. This can still be called creationism because it still holds that God is a first cause and a creator or designer. This approach claims that science and religion are entirely compatible. It requires taking a non-literal approach to the scriptures. It is inappropriate to use Genesis as a scientific text as this is clearly not its intention or purpose. Science tries to explain how things happen, whereas the Bible explains why, and this is the purpose of Genesis as far as this approach is concerned. Early humans needed a simple explanation of where humans and the earth came from, and needed it to be explained via an etiological story or myth. They incorporate the Big Bang and evolution into their thinking. God intervened, and that is why there was a Big Bang. This was the uncaused cause. God intervenes in history over billions of years, not over a seven-day time frame. A version of this approach can be seen in evolutionary creationism, whereby all the same features are present, except such people would believe there was a real Adam and Eve who came about as a result of evolution, but were the first spiritually aware human beings. This approach seems to be mostly compatible with the scientific approach in that it doesn't deny any aspect of it. However, it still holds on to the literal el element of seeing Adam and Eve as real people in history rather than mythologically representative of all humanity. This approach is very recent. It had its roots in William Paley's teleological argument whereby he argued for a designer based on the order and complexity found within the universe. However, the real beginnings of this movement were in 1987 in a legal case in the USA where it was argued that it was against the Establishment Clause to teach creation science because religion, science and state must be kept separate. As a result, people changed the wording of school textbooks in order to teach intelligent design rather than creationism. Intelligent design does not necessarily postulate a god as the designer in its reasoning, but thinkers like William Dembski argue that the aim is to research scientifically whether or not life has been designed by an intelligent designer. They argue that living systems show great complexity from which they can infer that some aspects of it in the natural world have been designed. Supporters of the intelligent design movement do not necessarily reject scientific theories, they just argue that these theories alone cannot be responsible for the emergence of the world in all its complexity. 
Philip E. Johnson, the author of Darwin on Trial, argued that evolution alone cannot account for how a new species can develop out of an older one. Thomas Kuhn, in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, talks about paradigm shifts as unproven. He claims that, in terms of DNA, whilst there might be a close relationship between different species of creature, such as apes and humans, we do not have the link that explains the shift between the two. Supporters of ID say that it should be taught in science lessons at school, whereas many other scientists would reject this as creationism by another name. This term is a feature of the theory of intelligent design. It was first used by Michael J. Behe in Darwin's Black Box in 1996. Behe uses the analogy of a mouse trap to show this idea. A mouse trap has many parts that must work together in order for it to work. ID thinkers assert that natural selection couldn't create irreducibly complex systems because the selectable function only works when all the parts are assembled. Similarly, in nature, there are a number of features that point towards irreducible complexity. For example, the blood clotting system. If one part was missing, then the blood would not clot. It cannot have evolved from anything else and cannot be reduced to any further to a less complex thing. Here, some things can be explained by evolution, but this cannot, so there must be a designer. Another example often cited is the bacterial flagellum. This is part of a particular bacteria that helps it to move around a bit like a propeller. This propeller cannot work without all of the features of it, as being shown in the diagram here, being present. It cannot be reduced to a less complex state, therefore there must be a designer. Scholars like Dawkins challenge this by pointing out that an arch of stone is irreducibly complex until we understand that we need scaffolding to keep it together until it is complete. Such systems as the blood clotting system, then, may be irreducible, but there may have been other systems in place that supported it whilst it developed, which are now redundant and have since fallen away. This theory argues that our planet was, like ba baby bear's porridge, just right for survival. This is a version of the anthropic principle, which argues that the Big Bang and all of evolution were put in place by God in order to create humanity, or intelligent life. It ascribes purpose to the process that some scholars would argue need not be there. The Goldilocks effect says that if the Big Bang had occurred but at a slightly different level or force, or if gravity had been a tiny bit stronger or weaker, humanity would have never come into being. The temperature of the Earth is just right. The ingredients and balance of features on the world are perfect for human survival, and so it must have been designed to be so. The strength of this argument lies in the fact that it does not deny any scientific theory. It merely observes that the features are, as they appear to be, perfect for human survival. However, it has been rejected by many as looking at human survival in the wrong way. The author, Douglas Adams, gives an analogy of a puddle in the Samuel of Doubt, clinging to the idea that the world was made this way to fit it when in fact it exists that way solely because of the environment. Humanity are as they are out of necessity because of the environment that preceded them, not because of any plan for their emergence.